Uh, well, thanks, Mike, for that great introduction and for inviting me here. It's always good to be talking to progressives. It's always good to be talking to Democrats. And, of course, Americans are good, too. Um, yeah, let me tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm running. And then, um, if you're interested, I can, I can talk about some contrast with myself and the other candidates. Um, but I have been doing good government work, working on voting rights issues, on campaign finance reform, full time as my profession for the last 19 years. Uh, most recently, with uh, Common Cause, where I was a national vice president um, responsible for all of the state program income cuts. So overseeing staff in 35 states across the country, including here in California, but also many other places. I live in Sacramento uh, and am based out of there. And it's really been um, through that experience and through working with the last three secretaries of state in California that I've come to the conclusion that we want to, California would be well served by having a, a real policy expert and someone with management skills in this office as opposed to the kind of musical chairs that we get with term limits where you have state senators that need a job, need somewhere to go, they wind up um, seeking statewide constitutional office before they run for Congress or the U.S. Senate or something like that. And, um, that's nobody's fault other than the, the criminal system that we're in, but I don't think it serves us very well in the Secretary of State's office. Uh, because we are on the verge of some incredibly important reforms right now in California that I think are just too important to leave up to politics as usual. Um, these are things that I helped pass uh, when I was at Common Cause through the legislature that could dramatically expand our electorate in California. Right now, um, does anyone want to take a guess where California ranks in terms of voter participation? Oh, 37th. 24th. 24th. Come on, we're the seventh largest economy in the world. Don't you think we can do better than that? 48th. Oh, 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 oh. That's what the U.S. Census Bureau has. There are some other metrics that have us either at 45th or 43rd. So depending on how you measure it, but either way, we can be doing a lot better. And, and this is not just sort of a point of civic pride or embarrassment, really. There are very real world implications for how we're making decisions in our state by having a, a small electorate that is wealthier, that is whiter, that is less diverse um, than the state of California, it's older, um, and less forward thinking. Uh, and you can look at public opinion surveys that the Public Policy Institute of California has done some great research on environmental issues on education issues, on the questions like, should we have an oil severance tax like every other state to rebuild our higher education system in California? If you look at the current electorate, we look incredibly divided. You know, it sort of feeds into this narrative of gridlock and partisanship. 49% you know, of Californians, roughly, or of likely voters, say, you know, I'd be willing to pay a little bit more in taxes for better government services. 49%, that's good. 45% say, no, you don't cut taxes, drown government, and you shrink it in the bathtub. And that's very hard to make any progress with numbers like that. If you look at non-voters, the numbers are two to one in favor of better services, better schools, and a willingness to pay for that. So that's what's at stake in expanding our election, our electorate. Now, the good news is we're on the verge of doing that. We have passed things like the same day voter registration. Last year, uh, register and cast a ballot on the same day like they've been doing in North Carolina. Um, we have passed a policy called pre-registration that would allow high school students to uh, register to vote. They still couldn't vote until they're 18, but we could get them into the database. Um, at age 17, I'd actually like to see that get down to age 15 so that when you're going into the DMV, right? What does everyone do when they're 15 and a half in California? Go get your learner's permit. You tell the state of California <laughs> your name, your address, your identity, and you're verifying your eligibility. Everything we need to register you to vote, we could do it automatically right there. Save a lot of data entry costs and get everybody into the system. So we pass these things, but what is holding us up is uh, all the legislation that approved them 
was contingent upon the state having a statewide voter registration database to make it all work. And the, the sad news is that the home of Silicon Valley and the technical leader in the world is the last state in the country to have a statewide voter registration. Yeah. The federal government gave us 10 years ago, uh, $40 million 10 years ago to build this. And I've now seen three secretaries of state manage to not get it done. Good news is Secretary Bowen has signed a contract with the vendor. Uh, she did that last March, so almost a year ago. And it's scheduled to be completed in June of 2016. Although I just heard one of her staff two days ago say, probably 2016. So we're already in danger of this slipping. And um, the interesting news, the other news, is the name of this vendor is called CGI, which <laughs> nobody had ever heard of until October. And now everybody's heard of it as the company that built the Affordable Care Act website. So we're failed to. Or fail. <laughs> so that doesn't guarantee that they're going to screw up our voter registration database, yeah. but it means we need to be worried about it. And it means that we yeah. need a Secretary of State who has management skills and, and can run a big agency and can oversee vendors and, if necessary, can get on the phone CEO to CEO and hold them accountable and make sure this is tested and make sure it works. Because these are the exact same policies that we don't have in California that the Republicans just repealed. North Carolina because they know they work. So there's no excuse for us not having that here. This is what's at stake in making sure that we have someone in this office who really cares about it, understands about it, isn't just using it as a stepping stone. I have pledged that if I'm elected, I will serve uh, the full term and hopefully a second term and not run for any other office during that period so I can solely focus on this uh, because there's so much at stake. Um, so that's one big thing, expanding our electorate. The second big opportunity that we have is to really rethink the way we run political campaigns and the way voters get their information about candidates and ballot measures. And right now, when you survey non-voters, that's the second biggest reason that they give for not voting, is they don't really feel qualified. They don't feel like they have enough information and a lot of times, that's pretty understandable. How many times have you been looking at two candidates for judge? You've never heard of either one of them. County assessor, some bond measure. And there's very little information. So... How got judge is coming since 2008. That one's easier. Yeah. Um, the Secretary of State right now is uh, sending out to every registered voter the official voter information guide. You've all probably seen this. It's about 147 pages thick of black ink on gray newsprint. And some people love it. You kind of know how to skim, you know, who are the three people that say yes and the three people who say no. And if you are an experienced voter, you can kind of navigate this document. But if you're a new voter, it's a bit daunting, actually, and boring. Um, I think that the state that invented YouTube and, and you know the Apple smartphone and Google Android could do a little bit better. I say we turn this into a digital app that you get on your smartphone. And we could give every candidate for office a series of online videos that they could use to talk directly to the voters in plain language. Here's what I'm all about. Same thing for the ballot measures. And uh, that would create a level playing field for every candidate to get their message out, whether they're backed by the big money in corporations or not. Um, and the other thing we could then do is right below those videos, we could have uh, information about who's funding their campaigns. And so you'd have that campaign disclosure right there at your fingertips when you're figuring out who to vote for, uh, which is critical. A lot of you probably remember in uh, November of 2012, we had this mysterious $11 million bring into California from a group in Arizona called Americans for Responsible Leadership, right? <laughs> Nobody had ever heard of. And they would never spent a dime in California on anything. And, um, you know, I was looking at that with my staff at Comic Cosmo. Right there. Why would this group in Arizona suddenly, and they never spent more than a million bucks on anything in their life. So the notion that somehow they just raised a million dollars and decided to spend it here did not pass the last test. So we filed a complaint at the Fair Political Practices Commission, and that led to three things. Um, 
One is they immediately launched an audit and, and started an investigation. And on election day, on the front page of the LA Times and most of our major papers in the state, they were exposed for a fraudulent group um, illegally laundering money in the California elections, which was particularly important because they were claiming to be in favor of campaign finance reform. Then Prop 32 was about it. It's really about kneecapping labor unions. But they said, oh, this is by the way, we're lying about our source of funds. Um, so that was helpful, but it still didn't tell voters who was really behind it. So um, about a year later, the uh, FPPC actually did issue a fine uh, of a million dollars against two front groups for the Koch brothers, who we had thought were behind it, and the FPPC confirmed it was Koch operatives moving this money largest fine in the history of California campaign finance law. So that's satisfying and it may act as a, a deterrent. But the really big news just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago in a very in-depth investigative journalist piece um, where the guy who was moving the money named Sean Noble, this you know, political operative in, in North Carolina, or no, in Arizona, admitted that he had $6 million more that he was planning to spend in California the last week before the election stopped because of the investigation because we caught. So this is a case where disclosure actually prevented six million dollars, you know, a lot of money that actually could have changed the outcome of Prop 30 and Prop 32 from moving into our state. Um, so disclosure is a good place to start. It, it, it's an important tool. We need to do more to make sure that that disclosure information is in front of voters before they vote, not a year after the election. So that's my plan as Secretary of State, but ultimately, you know, disclosure of big money in politics is a little bit like a CAT scan. You know, it tells you you've got a problem, but it doesn't cure it. You've still got the cancer inside you. And uh, to ultimately deal with it, we, we've got to just get the money out of politics. And uh, to make that happen, we need to take on five rogue justices on the Supreme Court right now who have issued rulings telling us that the First Amendment actually says money in there when it says Congress shall make no law limiting the freedom of money. I thought it said speech. <laughs> but they read it differently. So they, they literally edited our First Amendment and issued these rulings in Citizens United and other cases saying you cannot limit what a billionaire is going to spend to influence the outcome of the And even worse, you cannot limit what a corporation can spend to influence the outcome of an election because a corporation is a person with constitutional rights just like you and me. Well, this is absurd on its face, but this is what we are dealing with. And it is a very intractable problem because even in the instances where you can get a state legislature or the Congress to act, the courts are throwing it out. And they're doing it for partisan ideological reasons. So what do we do? Uh, there are a couple of ways you can change the Supreme Court ruling. One is the court could change itself, just like they did with Citizens United. They were reversing the previous decision of the court, and, and they could reverse themselves again. I don't think the five current justices are very likely to do that, but they won't be there forever. And there will be a confirmation hearing at some point, and one of them will get replaced. Hopefully one of them and not one of the four that are actually on the yeah. right side of this. Um, but it could change that way. And if that happens, I will definitely take it. The, the downside towards reversing it in that way is it could change again in 20 years. We, we could be playing ping pong with our Constitution every 20 years, almost like a Russian roulette of what justice dies when. And I don't think that's a way to take our Constitution seriously. Um, I think this is one of those instances, like the poll tax, uh, like the Dred Scott ruling, like other wrong-headed rulings of our Supreme Court where the people need to rise up and, and overturn the court through passing a constitutional amendment. And this is what uh, Congressman Peters has stood up for. Many members of Congress have stood up to do this. What I was doing at Common Cause <clears throat> when I was uh, uh, a national vice president there is uh, studying the history of how we've passed similar constitutional amendments to this 
the, the closest example I can think of is the 17th Amendment, which allowed us to vote for a U.S. Senator. They used to be appointed by state legislatures, and that process was incredibly corrupt. And the way they overcame that is uh, starting in Oregon, but also in California, and many other states, there were ballot measures. Um, asking voters, do you want to be able to directly elect your senator? And they even went further and they said, and who would you like that senator to be? And that was not a binding vote, but they instructed their state legislatures to appoint to the U.S. Senate whoever won that non-binding straw poll of the voters. And the legislatures did it. They felt morally bound to represent their constituents. Well, I think we can do the same thing here. So, when I was at Common Cause, we worked in Los Angeles and San Francisco to place measures on the ballot. And 77% in Los Angeles uh, voters called upon Congress to pass a constitutional amendment that would overturn Citizens United, establish that we could place limits on campaign contributions and spending, and establish that corporations do not have the constitutional rights of real people. 77%. In San Francisco, it was 82%. Okay? People go, well, Derek, those are kind of liberal cities, right? But we did the same thing statewide in Colorado, in a swing state, and in Montana, one of the reddest states in the country. Colorado passed 74% in Montana, 75%. In every single county, in every one of those states. So anyone who tells Congressman Peters that he's being too extreme needs to look at those election results. Because this is something that Democrats, Republicans, independents alike think is outrageous. Nobody thinks a corporation is a person, you know. And nobody thinks that it is fair to have one side spending five times what the other side is spending. Um, so I do think we will take this on. I, I think this will take some work. But uh, we are at a point where we, as a people, as a nation, need to solve this problem if we're going to make our government work and accountable to us again. So the next step here in California is to do this statewide and to get a vote all across California. And then what I will do as Secretary of State uh, is hold a hearing in every congressional district. And we'll ask Congressman Peters. And we'll ask some congressmen from the Central Valley. We'll ask every member of Congress to come to this hearing and explain to their constituents what are they doing to respond to the express wishes of their voters by a three to one margin. Um, that can't force them to do it. We can't go to court and say you're legally required to represent your people. But I think we can make the case politically that you're a representative. Your job is to represent your people. They have spoken. Here's what we expect you to do, and we're going to hold you accountable to that. And I think that is an appropriate role for the Chief Elections Officer of the State of California, and that's what I will do as Secretary of State. So those are some of the reasons that I'm running, to expand the electorate, to give voters better information about candidates and ballot measures through the Digital Voters Guide and to take on this crazy Supreme Court. Because that, that is what the founders had in mind with our system of constitutional checks and balances. When one branch goes off filter, the judicial branch in this case, the executive branch, the legislative branch, is supposed to check them. The Secretary of State takes an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of California from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well. It needs defense right now from five guys in black robes in Washington, D.C. So that is why I'm running. That's what the campaign is all about. Uh, for those of you who will be at the convention next week, uh, or this week, in a couple of days, uh, it'll be an exciting time. I think it is unlikely that the party will coalesce around any of the candidates. We have three good Democrats that are running, and it would be unusual for the Democratic Party to weigh in at, at the primary level. Nonetheless, I am asking delegates to support me as a way of putting the party on record uh, in terms of this platform and, and being strong against the Citizens United ruling. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, Senator Yee did actually call me as well today, Mike, uh, not just you, and, and I think he did sincerely want to come today. Uh, we've had several good debates and forums, 
and I saw a Twitter post from him. He's actually filing his papers to get on the ballot today. So, so that's kind of important. Um, you don't do that. Yet. <laughs> no one can vote for you. Um, so I think that's a pretty good excuse. Uh, I was a, a bit surprised at a candidate forum, I think it was exactly a week ago in Santa Cruz. Um, we got a question about public financing of campaigns. And, and both Senator Yee and I came out very strongly in favor of that. He's run under public financing uh, in San Francisco for local elections. I was actually the co-chair of a statewide ballot measure uh, in 2010, Prop 15, that would have established a pilot program for public financing in California. Uh, Senator Padilla said he opposed it. So that's one policy difference between the candidates that I even had not been aware of until recently, but I think that that's important for uh, the chief elections official to have a position like that, which is contrary to the platform of the Democratic Party, actually, in California. Um, the other policy difference that, that I have with Senator Padilla is uh, when I was at Common Cause, we led the effort to create uh, an independent citizen redistricting and this took the gerrymandering out of the hands of the legislature and put it into a, a bipartisan, well, multi-partisan, and had Democrats, independents, and, and uh, Republicans, all citizens, no politicians on this commission. And uh, the Democratic Party opposed that. So this is a situation where I was at odds with my party. I, I do think it is important for the Secretary of State to be nonpartisan and be independent. I'm running as a Democrat in order to be transparent about my political beliefs, but this was a situation where I had a different position. The, uh, the voters approved it, um, and Senator Padilla, even after the voters had spoken, spent $49,000 trying to repeal that, to take the power back into the hands of the legislature. And the Secretary of State actually is responsible for the initial process of setting up this commission. So it is relevant uh, to this office in particular, not during the next four years, but should whoever the next secretary is be reelected after that, they would be responsible for helping to implement this independent citizen redistricting commission. And if you tried to repeal it, I don't know what that means in terms of your commitment to that process. Um, so those are, are some of the policy differences. I think the other meaningful differences are just um, experience on the issues. You know, both of these state senators, if you're a state senator, you have to know hundreds of issues. And I give them both credit for, for being very good at that, you know, uh, and becoming an expert on, on dozens and dozens of things and bills that you offer. So if you want a, a secretary of state that knows about banning plastic bags or earthquake prevention or violent video games, I am not your guy. But if you want a Secretary of State who has spent 19 years working only on election-related issues, I think I am your guy. But both of these state senators were elected in 2006. They joined the Elections Committee in 2013. So they, they have two years of experience delving into these issues fairly deep. Two is good, but it's not the same as 19. Um, so those are, are some of the differences. Those are some of the reasons that uh, I decided to get into the race. And let me wrap it up uh, uh, with that and, and throw it open for questions. We have a fair amount of time for that, right? We do have time. Carl, you want to take over the Q&A session? Oh, and um, there's some lead if folks want to pass that out and take a look at it. Carol, I have this. Questions? Come on, this is interesting <laughs> stuff. Well, I, I, I've got a question, yeah, which is, I, right. yes, as Secretary of State, you are supposed to be neutral. You must be. Yeah. Well, you don't have to be. You're not legally required to. You should be. You should be. Yeah. And in that, how do you, so I, as a Democrat, yeah. I want to see that expanded voting, that expanded electorate, because Democrats will do better with that expanded electorate. How do you balance your need for neutrality with your drive to expand the electorate? I mean, I, 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 I know it's not purely a Democratic issue, but it's, you know, I, I, a Republican would say, well, you're, you're siding with the Democrats there, trying to expand the electorate. So, great question. Uh, the answer is that 
I am siding with democracy yeah. and trying to make yeah. every person yeah. vote. And political parties and, and politicians will adapt to the political views of the electorate over time. And that's what's supposed to happen. And so, uh, you know, if, if the electorate expands and, and that means the electorate has certain views, the, the candidates and parties should adapt and compete and try to reflect those views. And whichever party and candidate is best poised to do that should win. But we should not be artificially restricting the electorate or, or changing the election rules one way or the other to keep some people from voting because we don't like what their political views are. And, and that is, you know, this is a new thing. The, the, the Republican Party used to agree with that. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> We used to have an idea that, that, that politics would be about exchange of ideas and we'd have difference of opinion and may the best man win. And it's really just been in the last five years that you know Karl Rove and, and these operatives have got into this notion that they can't move their party's positions because the Tea Party is so rigid. So they can't adapt to the growing electorate, so they have chosen a strategy of, of keeping people out. And, and it is, frankly, un-American and shameful, and, and we need to call Poll them out. taxes go way back. Yes? So I, keeping yeah. people away from the voting the, 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 is an old oh, strategy. The, the founding fathers let white men who owned property vote, and that was it. And, and really, much of the history of America has been about expanding who we the people really are, right? Starting from white men who own property yeah. to all white men to black men to women to 18-year-olds to striking down literacy tests and poll taxes and, and Jim Crow in the South. That's all been forward progress. And suddenly we are seeing a retrenchment from that, um, which is new. And, and at least during my lifetime, in the last 40 years, uh, this is a, it was not a new concept, but uh, it, it is recent that we are backpedaling and shameful that we are backpedaling and we need to push back. And, and I will let no one tell me that that's a partisan position. That is a pro-democracy position and candidates and parties need to live uh, with that environment. Um, I, I will say some other things about that, though. You know, I, I think Secretary Bowen has done a, a pretty good job of refusing to endorse in, in, in races where she's the chief election official. A lot of people remember Katherine Harris in Florida in 2000, where she was you know, chairing George Bush's campaign while she was responsible for counting the votes. Uh, Ken Blackwell in Ohio in 2004, similar situation. So, we do need to make sure that we have an impartial and, and, and a, a person who behaves in a nonpartisan fashion. I think part of that is when you're applying for the job, being transparent about your own political beliefs so that people can evaluate you when you're in the job. Well, are you taking that position because you believe X or because it's fair? And if you refuse to tell them anything about your positions, you know, they, people can use non-transparency with nonpartisanship. So, yeah, question. I have a question regarding uh, felons that are able to vote in Florida. They're trying to squelch them still. Yeah. And uh, I really don't know the um, situation in California. I would like to know, um, mainly because a couple of years ago when I was trying to sign up people to vote, uh, a lot of young people would tell me they can't vote. Yeah. And I didn't know if it was because of the you know, drug war, uh, you know, trying to I have no idea of the connection, so that's my question. Florida's among a handful of states that imposes a lifetime ban on voting if you have been convicted of a felony. Uh, it's incredibly discriminatory. Um, California is, is among the better states in that the, the law here is once you've completed your sentence and completed your parole, you're eligible to vote. Now there is an, an interesting situation that has developed with Jerry Brown's early release system um, where there are about 65,000 people right now who are out of the jails, out of the prisons, not technically on parole, 
but on something called uh, uh, supervised release. And the League of Women Voters and the ACLU has filed a lawsuit against our Secretary of State. Uh, she's made a ruling saying, I don't think these 65,000 people should be able to vote. And I think that's the wrong thing. I, I'm with the League on this. These are people who, they're in society. They're playing by the rules. Many of them have jobs. They've done their time. And we need to integrate them back into society. And um, so, so that's where we're at. That point. What? So why she that way? I don't know, because um, I think she could have ruled either way. I, I do think that when you are, I, I, I should say, I think Deborah Bowen is very committed to this office. I think she's very progressive. I think she's very smart. That's why. Um, so, but I think that when you have had a career in politics and you're thinking about running for something else, like Congress, and, and she did run for Congress recently, you're maybe a little worried about a Willie Horton ad or a something that could come to haunt you. Down the road. Yeah, okay. and, and this is part of the reason why I've made the pledge that I have is I'm not going to run for any other office while I'm serving as secretary so I can call balls and strikes purely for what they are and, and work to make sure the vote counts. Whether that's good for me politically or not, because I'm not focused on the future, I'm, I'm focused just on this. Thank you. Yeah. How do you feel about single payer health care? <laughs> I strongly support single payer health care. Uh, I think it's a really good example of the problem of corporate money in politics because after we had a huge national mandate for change and hope around the issue of health care in 2008, we didn't even really start the debate out with real solutions, right? We first took pharmaceuticals off the table. We're not going to talk about Canadian drug reimportation or how to deal with pharmaceutical prices. We took single payer off the table and we started the negotiations with Mitt Romney's health plan, basically. Um, and you know, and then and public option. You know, so so there was a real fight around public option, which we didn't get. And there was at least that debate, but. That was because of the power of the HMOs, the insurance industry, the pharmaceuticals, cutting off half the policy ideas before the congressional debate even started, and it just got weaker from there. I still think it was better than doing nothing. There's a debate about that. You know, we're making progress, but we're not making near as much progress as we need to, or as we should be, or as what people, quite frankly, voted for very clearly. 2008. So, so this is why we have to get big money out of politics. Uh, I will say another thing about Senator Padilla. We did have a vote here in California to establish a single payer system. We got pretty close. Uh, there were five votes in the California Senate uh, that we were short. Five Democrats, and he was one of them, uh, that, that chose not to vote for single payer when we could have gotten it done here in California. I don't think that's relevant to the Secretary of State's office, but I think it is relevant in terms of being a progressive. And, you know, it's hard to stand up to big money in politics when you spend your whole career taking it. Yeah. I have a question. I'd like to know how you feel about instant runoff voting and whether the Secretary of State can be involved with that. That's my yeah. question. Um, I tend to think instant runoff voting solves a lot of problems. Uh, it, it solves the, the problem of a spoiler election, like you know, sort of a Ralph Nader in Florida, although there were 10 other problems there, that all a perfect storm of election problems, of which this was one of them. I, I think it might be a way to deal with this top two primary that we have now that, that I think does not serve California well. I, I think the top two is, is based on this cynical logic of denying voter choice, really. I mean, and, and in this race, even, we could wind up with two Democrats on the ballot in November for Secretary of State if the Republican vote splits uh, three ways, which might actually happen. I don't think that serves the state of California particularly well. If you're a Republican and you can't even vote for someone who represents your point of view, uh, that's going to dampen voter participation, and, and it's, it's going to it reduces the ability of our election system to accurately reflect the will of the people when you're not giving them choices that represent their political viewpoint. 
happens. So instant runoff voting would be one way to solve that. Um, the role the Secretary of State can play there, because um, we have instant runoff voting in, in many localities in California, San Francisco, Oakland, some other East Bay cities. And we need to make sure that the election equipment that the Secretary of State is certifying can at least accommodate those localities um, and, and be able to do a ranked choice ballot. So that's the role of the Secretary of State that I see is making, you know, let's at least give communities the choice and, and we can experiment with it and, and see how it works. Um, but we got to make sure that we've got equipment that, that can accommodate that. Yeah. I think it's more important than electing, actually, because I think we, we have an oligopoly of two parties right now, which is not good for the country. Yeah. So third and fourth opinions about serious issues don't get in. I think that's probably, to me, more overriding than the fact that you, you get a fair result. Well, we need both. <laughs> we, we, we need a, a wide diversity of candidates to give voters choices, but I think we also need a fair result where the person who wins has the support of the majority of voters in the district. And I think instant runoff voting may be one way to, to do both of those things. Yeah. I'm curious to know how aware you are of Beverly Harris's work. Ben Harris. Black box voting. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, because she unearthed fraud of all different sorts. I mean, they're very conniving yeah. in so many ways. And we have election fraud nationwide. Um, also, Brad Long, I don't know if you yep. ever, well, it's just sickening. And it, 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 it frankly makes one feel that, uh, you know, we try very hard to get our candidates in there, but we're always up against this wall of secrecy that denies us our real elected uh, people that we try to put into office. And we have no way of knowing whether the election was true or not. We really do not have a way to trust the elections. Yeah, I've never met Ben Harris, but I have read her work. I've met Brad. I, I, I know uh, Pam Smith, the Verified Voting Network, who's from here in the San Diego area. When I was at Common Cause, this wasn't my lead area of expertise. A woman named Susanna Goodman in our Washington, D.C. office handled it. But prior to that, I was with uh, uh, PERCS, CalPERG, and the Public Interest Research Groups. And I did uh, research voting equipment. This is going back 10 years ago. but. Uh, I have long supported the need to have a paper ballot um, that you can do a hand recount of, that you can do an audit of, that's the official vote of record. And, and this is one area where I give Secretary Bowen incredibly high remark, uh, marks. You know, I don't think we are perfect here in California, but I would say she is the best Secretary of State in the country in terms of pushing the envelope on this. Yeah. She did this top to bottom review of our election equipment. Yeah. Uh, got a lot of pushback from county registrars and equipment manufacturers, and, and she held firm. And she has told me personally that she is worried that on the second day of the next secretary's term, there are a couple of counties in California who are still holding on to those touch codes that she decertified. They've got them shrink wrapped in their basement, and they're going to make a move to try to bring them back. And we have seen this happen in California before, after Kevin Shelley took them on. Bruce McPherson let them back in. So we need, you know, I, I was surprised to hear that from her, to tell you the truth, because I thought, you know, we've sort of been there, done that, that we've won this battle in California, and we have to, we, we need to stay vigilant. Los Angeles is in the process of building a new election system that has some exciting opportunities, but could have some of these same pitfalls. So it will fall to the next secretary to certify those. And we need to make sure that we really have someone who understands the security issues um, and, and the accessibility issues and, and the workability issues. So, um, so well, issue. as a programmer, I'm very, very concerned with anything electronic. And it's not yeah. just the electronic voting machines, it is the off scan machines, the scanners Tabulators. they use. Yeah to supposedly count our votes, I think they use them to actually change our votes. And we had a congressional candidate named Clint Curtis in Florida precisely go to Congress. He testified before Congress. And he was programmed uh, at the behest of some Republican who he ran against later um, to create programs that would steal elections. Now, our Congress did nothing about that. But we need, we need a Secretary of State that's fully aware that electronics allows them to steal our elections. 
Yeah, I, another thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about the difference in the candidates, um, I, I, and this was the thing that pushed me over the edge deciding that I had to run. Uh, when Lee Ling Yee announced his candidacy, it was around a single platform of bringing online voting to California. Yeah. Um, which has all of the security all problems the you problems. just mentioned times 10. Okay. Um, he subsequently modified his position on that, which I was very happy to see. He backed away and said, well, we're not ready now. We'll work towards it. So it's better. But it was an indication to me that he didn't have a very deep grasp of these election integrity issues. And uh, it's, there's just too much at stake, as you just pointed out, with making sure that our voters so are not to back to better run. Yeah, there's one there. What? There's one My water's here. <laughs> Thank you. Good <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, yeah. How in the world is it going to take even more than three months to put together a Statewide voter database. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good question. It, it is not that technically difficult. What I have learned in, in following this closely is uh, the state procurement process is completely broken. Mm -hmm. It is not just this project in the Secretary of State's office. It is pretty much every IT project in the state of California takes five times longer, costs five times as much, and fails. DMV, EDD, all of these contracts. And, you know, I, I've had conversations with John Chung about this, the controller's office. He says this happens in the private sector. Well, look at the Obamacare website, right? I, that was public sector, but um, I think it is the case that tech projects are hard. But I think it is also the case that vendors have figured out how to game the system. And they come in with the lowest bid and then do a lousy job and require the agency to submit a lot of change orders to make the thing actually work and run the bill up in those change orders. So insourcing. Yeah. I think that might actually be the solution is building some of these things in-house. The, the digital voters guide that I'm talking about is something that I think we can build in-house. Um, there are some downsides to that as well. The Cal Access system that we have right now uh, was built in-house under Secretary Bill Jones in the early 1990s. And it was actually cutting edge technology at the time. Uh, it's built on mainframe computers running things like Fortran and Cobalt and, and lots of currently obsolete languages. And that system crashed for three months in December of 2010, you might remember. We couldn't look up lobbyist registrations or campaign finance data for a period of three weeks. The press were completely apoplectic. Right? And I was getting phone calls from the press and commenting on how this was unacceptable. And that led me to getting anonymous phone calls and emails from current and former Secretary of State and staff. And they basically said, well, what happened is the one guy who built it in the 90s who knew how to make it work with the bailing wire and the duct tape, he quit because he didn't like the manager. That, you know, and it, it was clear it was partially a technology failure, but partially a management failure. And so doing it in-house works if we're going to have competent managers in the Secretary of State's office for the next 20 years, which we should have, but it's not guaranteed. So... Um, I still err on the side of let's build up the capacity within government to do this as opposed to outsourcing it to vendors who rip us off and do shoddy work. So that is why I say there's some opportunities with what's going on in Los Angeles where Dean Logan, the registrar there, is trying to build his own voting equipment in-house. And um, that's why it's an exciting thing as long as we make sure it gets done right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a question about strategy. Uh, those of us who will be voting this weekend for an endorsement have the choice of you three. Or here for an endorsement. Um, Big pardon? Or here for an endorsement. Okay, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's not where I'm getting at, although I'm certainly not opposed to that. But the fact, the scuttlebutt, it's more than scuttlebutt, is that Alex Padilla is a very popular senator. And that if it comes to a when it comes to a vote, he's very likely to win. 
And then even if the electorate in the state doesn't like him. So what strategy would work to keep that from happening? I've heard two possibilities. One is to, you know, everyone vote for you, which it would be a little difficult to get to a range. I mean, I'm in favor of it. The other one is to vote for no endorsement. So what do you think would work best? Well, just to explain the process a little bit, um, uh, John Burton, the chair of the Democratic Party, asked all three candidates for Secretary of State not to contest the party's endorsement because he didn't think it made sense for the party to get involved at a primary level when you have three Democrats running. Mm -hmm. the two of us agreed to that, myself and Leland Yee. Alex Padilla did not, which is his right. Um, so we, and had that happened, there wouldn't even be a vote on Saturday. But it did not, so there will be a vote. And there are a couple of different, well, I actually think it is unlikely that anyone will get the endorsement because to get that, you need 60% of the delegates who are voting among four different options, each of the candidates plus a vote for no endorsement. Um, there are several key voting blocks who I do not think will support Senator Padilla, uh, among them the California Teachers Association and all their delegates, and, and I would be surprised if many members of the Progressive Caucus, due to things like the health care vote that we talked about and the public financing position, there are almost enough delegates between the Progressive Caucus and the teachers to deny right there. And then there are folks who actually support me and actually support you. <laughs> um, and I, I expect many of the delegates who are appointed by members of Congress and by state legislators who are neutral in this race, most the majority of the legislature is neutral. They've stayed out. The majority of Congress is neutral. They have stayed out. I expect those appointed delegates to follow the request of Chairman Burton. Burton, he didn't request. He, he just said, he, my own preference, how, I, I'm going to be voting no endorsement because that's what I think the party should do. You're all free to do what you want. So that's fine. I think a lot will do that. Um, I think some will vote for Senator Yee because they, they're from the Bay Area. They've known him for 30 years. He has a base of support there. I think some will vote for me because they believe in the issues that I'm talking about. I think you add up those three votes, nobody else you know, gets to 60%. Uh, I do think, though, that, that it, it, it doesn't really matter. A vote for me or ye or no endorsement all has the same effect of denying a party endorsement. So I think people should vote their conscience. And many people really do think there should be no endorsements and no preference, and that's a perfectly legitimate position for a Democratic delegate to take, I think. So if that's your view, you should vote that. I think if you support Senator Yee, you should have no qualms voting for him. If you support what I'm talking about, you should have no qualms. And if you support Senator Padilla, by all means, vote for him. I mean, he does have the right to contest the nomination, and that's what he's doing. And if he gets it, it'll be a big boost for him. So that's what democracy is, right? And we should have a vote, and we're having a vote, and people are out there campaigning, and, you know, that's good. I mean, my, my thought is, is I think the people of California should decide in the primary as opposed to the 3,000 delegates of the Democratic Party. Well, that would be nice, but we no longer have a primary that works that way. Yeah, that's true. The people of California don't, the, 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 the Democratic voters of California can no longer pick the Democratic nominee because we've moved to this top two system. So I agree with you, but that's not the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and I do think there could be some situations with this top two where it would make sense for the party to endorse. Certainly lots of congressional races and assembly races, the party's endorsing, they've coalesced with one person, it makes sense. That's fine, I don't think it's an illegitimate process. Uh, I just think in this particular race, it's highly unlikely that anybody gets to that 60% threshold. Are there any Republicans running, at least serious ones? Yes, um, so let's talk about the rest of the race because this actually, speaks to the type of candidate I think the Democrats would be well served to have in November. There is one declared Republican, a guy named Pete Peterson, who is an academic at Pepperdine University. He's a nice guy. 
he's an attractive candidate. He is way more moderate than a lot of Republicans. You know, supports pro-choice. He supports election day registration. All of these policies I was talking about. He says yes. Let's expand the electorate in California. That's the right thing to do. And my hat's on. You know. That, if he were to win, that'd be the only Republican Secretary of State in the country calling for that, and that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to my nonpartisan comment, if he were to win, would he be calling he for it? I think he would. I, I think he's an honest guy. Uh, I don't think he'll win because having an R on your after your name in November in the state of California is very, very difficult. There is another Republican who has filed to be in the voters' guide but has not raised any money, and I don't know if he will be on the ballot. We will know by Friday. Um, but neither of them are well known at all. So if those two are in, you could almost expect the Republican vote to split randomly. <laughs> One of them. The very interesting curveball then is we have a self-described former Republican, um, Dan Schnur, who was Pete Wilson's press secretary, did press for John McCain's presidential campaign. He's a very savvy political operative who has entered the race uh, declaring no party preference. So, um, which is the biggest party in California now? No. Not even close. It's roughly 20% of the voters have registered with no party preference. That makes them third. They're the fastest growing. But they're second in San Diego, though. Oh, I would believe that. I would believe that. Um, not all of those are sort of true independents. About a quarter of them really will vote for a Republican. About half of them really will vote for a Democrat. So it's not a huge, it, it's not as big as it looks. But they are there. Um, so certainly if, if Schnur can present himself to Republicans as a former Republican and present himself to independents as a current independent, there's a chance that he could get into the top two, for sure. And he won't have an R after his name. He would have an I after his name. The media love him. He looks squeaky clean. And I actually think that's about the only scenario where a Democrat could lose a statewide race is to have a Republican in name omitted, the new version of Rhino, running against, and you'd have to run against a Democrat who had enough flaws that you could actually run some negative ads against them and, and cause Democratic voters not to vote for Democrat, which is hard to do. But. Senator Padilla, when he ran for the Los Angeles City Council, was fined $79,000 by the Los Angeles Ethics Commission for breaking their campaign finance rules. <laughs> I could see a negative Wait, what ad. What position is he running He's for? He's running to be the chief election official. <laughs> he, in the past year, had one of Sacramento's biggest lobbyists, a guy named Kevin Sloat, uh, do a fundraiser for him in the lobbyist's house where the lobbyist was handing out wine and cigars, which was illegal. The lobbyist got fined $133,000 for doing this. That's another negative act. This is why I don't think the Democratic Party is going to coalesce around any of the candidates. Didn't Leland Yee get in some trouble, or would you rather not talk about it? I'll let him explain that, but that did come up at the debate forum uh, last week as well, um, and I just don't know enough about it to speak to it, so I won't. So how cute is the Republican out of Prepper Dye? Because you're pretty <laughs> <laughs> I think he's really nice looking. I'm cute, cute but he's a close second. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, you know, for a Republican, he's a nice guy. Yeah. You know, this is not like but you, you, you some of the other. Yeah, but you got to keep you. You're pretty good looking, so you, you got to cheat. <laughs> well, I, I could beat Pete Peterson hands down in general. I think I could beat Dan Schnur hands down because, you know, what are the ads that are going to run? He's been too adamant for campaign finance reform. Okay. <laughs> right. 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 Um, yeah. Too, too strident calling for overturning Citizens United is what they're attacking your local congressman for. Run that ad against me. <laughs> to bring it on. Okay. Um, anyhow, any other questions or should we wrap up? Yeah. There's just one more. Um, I know that the Secretary of State is the Chief Elections Officer of California, but 
the secretary actually has a lot of other yeah. things in his or her portfolio. Could you just sort of talk about some of those and the changes that you might make? Yeah, so real quick, one of the other very important jobs of the Secretary of State is to register businesses. And this too is something that we are in the middle of automating. We're still using three by five index cards right now in the Secretary of State's office to file trademarks for new businesses. Um, but similar to the voter registration system, Secretary Bowen has started on this project. There's an RFP out there right now to automate this. It might cost $20 million. It's scheduled to be done in 2016. Why it would take that long? It shouldn't. But big project underway uh, that, again, is not sexy, but we sort of need a manager, bureaucrat, someone who wants to roll up their sleeves and make sure that that gets done because it's unacceptable. A, a year ago, it's taking an average of 43 days to start a new business in California, six days in Texas. You know, that's not good. So that's an important function. Um, notaries public are registered for the Secretary of State. I don't have any big agenda for changing that, but if you know of a problem, let me know. Um, one thing that is, is kind of interesting, most people don't know, the state archives are maintained by the Secretary of State. I think there's some opportunities to digitize those archives the way Harvard is doing with their library and Google so that you don't have to actually fly to Sacramento to access it. You can do it from San Diego. And the other thing that I think that the time has come for is, uh, you know, we, we have a section in the archives on the railroads. We have a section in the archives on the Japanese internment camps after World War II. These are important parts of our history, right? And I think uh, the time has come for us to have a section in the state archives about the LGBT civil rights movement that has made so much progress in California, but I actually think globally. I, I think there is a story to tell that a lot of that global movement came out of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Hollywood. We have been a, a cultural leader far beyond our boundaries in that particular struggle. And I think it's important to commemorate it as part of the official history of California. So I've been talking to some folks in that community who are going to help me put that together. Um, so that's another aspect of the job. Um, do you have a particular thing other than that? that no, I just wanted the, our audience to be aware that there's yeah. more things that the Secretary of State does besides elections. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, all, thank you all for the opportunity. just for the work that you do as as party activists you know I, i'm coming to this uh from a nonpartisan background you know with common cause and so i haven't been going to party functions for my last we're not 20 technically years. But, but you're not technically i know so that's good but <laughs> nonetheless what, what i want to say is I, I think that the official democratic party as well as dfa and pba and groups like that collectively are the most impressive and most important civic organization in the state of California. Just from a pure voter registration, voter education, get out the vote, mm -hmm. doing the actual hard work of making democracy function. It's not just the elections officials who make that happen. It is grassroots mm -hmm. activists who are doing the work of politics. And that's you, and thank you for doing that because that's really important. So. <laughs> Sacramento and areas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when was the last time you were home? This is a better question. <laughs> uh, I've been in LA all this week. Uh, I my wife grew up in LA. Her mom still has a house there, so that's good. I will be in the South again for two full weeks in the middle of April and would love to come back to San Diego then. Um, like to do some press events here. It'd be helpful to have activists at those events. You all look kind of like activists. Um, so when, when we get that scheduled, I'll call up with Mike and let you all know about opportunities to do that. Okay. Great.